Let us be mindful this morning of the light within us all, the yearning for freedom, the longing for truth, the flame of intuition, the torch of conscience. We dedicate this service this morning to the remembrance of this holy light. And at this time, all of us have an opportunity to bring some extra light into our community by lighting candles of community. Might be a joy, might be a concern, might be some kind of celebration that you have or something that's maybe weighing heavy on your heart at this time. This is a time to share that together in a time of silence as we light the candles of community. Our chalice reminds us that the fire within ourselves is the same fire that illuminates the universe. It is our reminder that all is connected even, through, even though the space of the void is vast. And our experience here is but a blip in the cosmic timeline. This flame is our promise that in our smallness and our short time on this earth, that we live intently and deeply with love for one another, with honesty and integrity, to be guided by rational thought and critical thinking, and with a sense of shared responsibility. For as the late astronomer Carl Sagan reminded us, this pale blue dot is the only home we've ever known. Let us join together in the spoken affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and freedom and to help one another. Our opening thought also comes from Carl Sagan from his novel Contact. 
We all have a thirst for wonder. It's a deeply human quality. Science and religion are both bound up with it. What I'm saying is, you don't have to make stories up. You don't have to exaggerate. There's wonder and awe enough in the real world. Nature's a lot better at inventing wonders than we are. Our first song this morning is song 175. We celebrate the web of life. first reading comes to us from The Sense of Wonder by Rachel Carson. A child's world is fresh and new and beautiful, full of wonder and excitement. It is our misfortune that for most of us, that clear-eyed vision that true instinct for what is beautiful and awe-inspiring is dimmed and even lost before we reach adulthood. If I had influence with the good fairy who is supposed to preside over the christening of all children, I should ask that her gift to each child in the world be a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last throughout life as an unfailing antidote against the boredom and disenchantment of later year, the alienation from the sources of our strength. Let us enter a time of meditation. And our meditation this morning comes from those words written by Carl Sagan, the pale blue dot. Look again at that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust 
suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Our second reading comes from Albert Einstein. And I am told that unlike many quotes that are attributed to Einstein, this is actually something Einstein said. <laughs> I do not believe that a moral philosophy can ever be founded on a scientific basis. The valuation of life and all its nobler expressions can only come out of the soul's yearning toward its own destiny. Every attempt to reduce ethics to scientific formulas must fail. Of that, I am perfectly convinced. Our next song is song 174, O Earth, You Are Surpassing Fair.
I think too often we've approached science as a value-free enterprise. And we treat the world that we are investigating scientifically as not possessing intrinsic value, not possessing inherent worth, value for its own sake. In this approach, the value of the world is often equated to its usefulness, its utility, its instrumentality, rather than seeing the world as having value for its own sake, inherent worth. This approach contributes to the reduction of the natural world to an object to be used, manipulated, commodified, and controlled rather than being seen as a community of life of which we are all a part. This objectification of nature might lead to some advances in scientific understanding as we prod and coerce our world to give us new insights. It might lead to the development of some new technologies, but these scientific and technological advances are made at a significant moral cost which now threatens the very survival of humanity itself. We need science. We need science for greater understanding and knowledge, but we also need ethics and the intentional cultivation of wisdom to use science and technology in ways that will contribute to both human and ecological flourishing. Science helps us know things, but we also must learn to use that knowledge wisely for the good of all. Working effectively together as a human community to do what is right and good in the world involves learning what we ought to do. It involves cultivating the will and the desire to do what we ought to do. And then it involves developing the ability to actually do it. And this requires ethics and science to work together cooperatively. Without science, we would often not know how to do what it is that we ought to be doing, or even what it is that we ought to be doing. But without ethics, we may never cultivate the wisdom and will to use science in a morally responsible way. Ethics needs science to learn how we can actually address the social and ecological challenges we are facing. But science needs ethics to address those challenges with wisdom, empathy, compassion, and justice. Ethics without science can often leave us clueless about the actual challenges we are facing. But science without ethics can lead to the mistreatment of life and the destruction of value for the sake of advancing science for its own sake and for the sake sometimes of unscrupulous persons rather than for the sake of the whole world. Science without ethics leads us to the development and use of chemical and biological weapons and the construction and use of gas chambers of mass death. Science without ethics leads us to the knowledge of nuclear fission and nuclear fusion without the morality needed to avoid Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Science without ethics leads to an industrial agricultural system that treats living beings simply as meat producers rather than beings of sacred worth. Science without ethics leads to billionaire space races 
rather than a race to end poverty, hunger, and disease. Science without ethics leads to the fracking of our planet to squeeze every last bit of oil and gas out of the ground while our planet burns and we destroy a livable climate. Science without ethics may lead to some knowledge, but the cost is great. The cost is great. Yes, we need science to effectively address the challenges we are facing, but science without ethics will likely to continue to hurl us towards climate chaos and contribute to the continuation of the sixth great extinction on our planet. We simply can no longer afford science without ethics. And we can no longer allow the oligarchs of our planet to continue to use science for their financial gain, the feeding of their egos, and the satisfying of their fetish for power, rather than using science for the good of the whole earth, including its most vulnerable members. The global pandemic has brought us a lot of things. Most of those things are horrible, but it has brought us to a decisive moment again when it comes to the relationship between science and ethics. Science has shown us that it can bring us vaccines, but it can't bring us vaccine equity in which all persons in the world have equal access to those vaccines. Science has shown us that it can bring us vaccines, but it cannot cultivate the sense of community responsibility that is needed to bring about a higher vaccination rate of persons for the common good. Science can help us learn about the virus. It can help us learn what we need to do to mitigate against its spread, but it cannot move the hearts of persons to wear masks indoors or socially distance for the sake of others. Science can provide knowledge to businesses it can provide knowledge to, to other institutions about how to protect their employees, their customers, and other constituents. But it can't provide the moral commitment that is needed for them to actually take the measures that will keep people safe. Like so many of the great challenges that are faced by the human community today, our failure, I think, to fight against COVID-19 is as much or perhaps more of a moral failure than it is a failure of science or a failure of knowledge. And until we somehow address this, we may never be able to defeat this virus. But it's not just the challenge of this global pandemic, it's the urgent challenges that we're facing around the world, both in the human and ecological community. If we don't somehow address the moral commitment that we need, if we don't somehow address the importance of cultivating love and wisdom and justice in our communities, we may never be able to meet these urgent challenges that we are experiencing in this world on this pale blue dot, on this world house, which is and always will be our only home. At this time, we'll have our time of giving and those of you who wish may bring your gifts to the table. Or you can also give online at the digital table uh, on the church mobile app home screen.
hello there, Red River. I'm pleased to tell you that uh, Intook is awarding you a grant for, to help expand your multi-platform ministry. $7,200 ought to buy you plenty of equipment. So spend it well and give us a report when, uh, before the year, or at the end of a year. And I'll pass the check off now to Jim. Here you go. Do well. Thank you, Intuck, for this grant money. This grant will go a long way for us migrating our church to the hybrid church of the future. This $7,200 will be well spent and we're well on our way to spending it. So again, thank you, Intuck. What a nice surprise. <laughs> our next song is uh, Blue Boat Home and the lyrics will be on the screen. Parting thought comes from the ethical scientist, Rachel Carson again, from The Sense of Wonder. She writes, it is not half so important to know as to feel. Let's join together in the extinguishing of the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, for the fire of commitment, these we carry in our hearts until we are together again. 